As Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution is on the horizon, I thought now would be a better time than any to explore the past of Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. Yu-Gi-Oh! games have always been this weird medium of experiencing Yu-Gi-Oh! for me. They ditch the need to collect cards in real life and give you a way to experience Yu-Gi-Oh! without the need for playmat or card sleeves. They've never attempted to go full anime with a cinematic story experience, or at least make one that doesn't involve so many text boxes. Yu-Gi-Oh! has also not had too many spin-off games, nor games that often attempt gameplay styles that focus on something outside of playing the actual card game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Out of the entire library of Yu-Gi-Oh! games, it seems like Yu-Gi-Oh! The Fallsbound Kingdom will probably hold the title for the most unique and original Yu-Gi-Oh! game for a long time coming. I mean, it's either that or Dungeon Dice Monsters. You wretched mortal! So pretty much every other Yu-Gi-Oh game, whether story driven or not, was held up on the backbone of playing the card game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Which is cool and all, but it seems there's a bit of an oversight here. <laughs> Prepare yourself. Let's just start by taking games like Yu-Gi-Oh the Sacred Cards and the previously mentioned Fallspawn Kingdom out of the equation. Sacred Cards had a good rendition of Battle City for a Game Boy game and almost played Yu-Gi-Oh like normal, but it decided adding typing advantages was something Yu-Gi-Oh needed when it most definitely was not. The Fallsbound Kingdom took a whole different approach to Yu-Gi-Oh being in this whole virtual reality closed map tactical RPG Fire Emblem type game that had monsters battle like Final Fantasy or Pokemon in 3v3 battles and made you collect all the monsters like they were Pokemon. It kind of worked. It's not the best RPG out there, but if you're into both Yu-Gi-Oh! and JRPGs, then I'd recommend giving it a try. So looking at the majority, Yu-Gi-Oh! games play the same as you would play the game in real life, if you had the cards to play. From Eternal Soul to Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championships to Zexal Duel Carnivals through the Tag Forces and finishing it off at the previous Legacy of the Duelists and the popular app Duel Links, these games are what the bulk of Yu-Gi-Oh! games are like. That's where we hit the problem. Unless you're into text box storytelling, most of these Yu-Gi-Oh! games will have very little substance or variety outside of just playing the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Don't get me wrong though, the actual card game of Yu-Gi-Oh! itself is nothing short of a complex, interactive, mind-challenging, turn-based strategy game. On top of that, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game that is constantly changing and reaching new heights at a pace somewhat described as too fast. New ban lists, new archetypes, and new master rules are what keeps the game fresh and never stop it from going stale. Mix these new features in with a new Yu-Gi-Oh! anime every three years, and you have a franchise that somewhat seems to always have something fresh upcoming for its consumer base. It never leaves us out in the dark. So that's where the problem lies. Longevity. Things change so fast that nothing stays one way for too long. Yu-Gi-Oh! games never took big advantage of updates for anything longer than a few months. Rather than improving the card pool and rulings in a singular game, Konami opted to make a new game around every year or so, instead to make up for the constant influx of new cards. Now, in real life, you obviously own the cards you collect and have the choices on how you use them, trade them, or sell them. When a new banlist or update to the game comes out, and you need a new deck, you utilize either your card pool or your wallet to get you whatever cards you need. You never be required to completely reset your card pool simply because those updates happen. And that brings me to my second problem about Yu-Gi-Oh games, which is sort of a product of the first. You seldom get to carry over your card pool from one game to the next, if ever. Let's look at Pokemon for a sec. Now, I know y'all are probably thinking, Nistro, there's no way to actually compare these two when they're completely different franchises and card games, right? And you'd be right for the most part. I'm not going to sit here and do a long form comparison to the Pokemon TCG to the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG on this issue. I feel despite Pokemon's multiple formats, the longevity of being able to use certain cards in particular formats isn't handled as well as Yu-Gi-Oh! But before any PTCG heads respond, I'd like you to know I meant take a look at the Pokemon video games. From the very first generation all the way to Pokemon Sun and Moon, which is around 20 years apart, you could transfer your Pokemon all the way from, from any generation as far back as the very first generation 
all the way to Sun and Moon as long as you had the right tools. Think about that. Any Pokemon that you raised, any Pokemon that fought by your side or that you grew a connection with, could come with you to your next journey no matter how old they were, all the way up to the latest game. It was a bit easy for Game Freak to manage this since every Pokemon game was on a Nintendo console. Now, older Yu-Gi-Oh games had a somewhat complicated way to let you carry over cards from real life into the game. If you noticed, uh, almost every Yu-Gi-Oh card has an 8 digit code number on its bottom left corner. In Yu-Gi-Oh Eternal Duel of Soul, there's a shortcut to, to get these cards in the game. If you enter the code into, um, into the game, then you get the card in the game. See, see how that works? I read it off the card I have. Now, back in those days, the internet wasn't as prominent, so for the most part, if, if kids wanted to get these cards in the game, you'd either need to have the cards in real life or the 2003 Game Boy Advance cheat guidebook. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards today still have those codes on them. To this day! Nowadays, if we had a system like that, all you'd need to do is Google to look up every card you need and it would kind of ruin the point of progressing through the game itself. Uh, at that point, they might as well just give us access to the entire Yu-Gi-Oh card uh, library from, from the beginning and just save us the trouble. I'm, I'm balling, man! But, uh... Konami doesn't want to do that for some reason. I dare I'm balling, man! I'm balling! Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Transfer th for the uh, Nintendo Wii had a different idea on how to transfer your cards from real life into the game. Konami tried creating a scanner that could scan cards in real life so that you can use them in game. It would probably be a long tedious pain like to put a whole deck into the thing since to read them you'd have to go card by card by card and you couldn't put hollows like you couldn't put certain certain rarities in like, it would have been hard to differentiate what what cards would have been allowed and what cards wouldn't have been allowed the good news is that most most of the people who played dual transfer never actually had to go through that tedious process and that's because uh the scanner was actually never released outside of japan because it didn't work properly and had too many issues you can see it's supposed to be sold separately and you can actually use your cards in the game supposedly uh can't use uh, magazine cards, special edition, sneak preview cards, holographic rare cards, or token cards. Put your card in like it's shows in the picture, like it has a jump destroyer there. The game seems alright too. Uh, I'm gonna get a Tag Force 5 instead for now. And the point is that Pokemon kept transferring Pokemon between games consistent for so long across multiple games and consoles, so it wouldn't have been impossible for Konami to do something of the sort. At the very least, in Tag Force, you could just download someone's save data from online to get all the cards immediately. So it's not like the worst situation ever if you're a level 100 hacker like myself. The ability to transfer cards between games would have made the constant influx of Yu-Gi-Oh games easier to deal with. And the fact that we never got a reasonable way to do it is kind of what makes Yu-Gi-Oh! games feel like such a waste in retrospect. Realizing this creates one big question for this game series. Who are these Yu-Gi-Oh! games for? Despite what I said earlier about Yu-Gi-Oh! always seeming to have something in store for fans of all kinds, casual and competitive, the games don't always feel like they are correctly tapping into neither the casual nor the competitive market. So if you're not one already, imagine you're a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! player spending money and trading for the best cards in the format. Maybe you got a plug who just gives you the cards for free, I don't know. You spend hours playtesting in preparation of every big event that you have the capability to attend. If you ignore stuff like exclusive pre-order cards, what worth is a Yu-Gi-Oh! video game to you? Every Yu-Gi-Oh! player in the know is already familiar with platforms like Dueling Book or apps like Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro. Uh, if you're not aware, Dueling Book is a website where you can create a profile and essentially have access to every card in the game at once to build your deck and play um, online with other people. Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro is the same thing, except it's a more polished, downloadable app re resembling how games would play, except you play with other people online. So you can choose your format and usually have access to OCG exclusive and anime cards as well. So with platforms like these, why would a Yu-Gi-Oh! video game even be necessary? Why spend time grinding through a low effort story and buying make-believe packs to get cards that you already have access to if you were playing on Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro or Dueling Book? 
which, if it wasn't clear already, are both free programs. It seems redundant to spend money on a product that does little to make itself stand out and has more hassle and grind than what it's worth. These are why these games don't really survive and have very little purpose for existence for those who are actively into Yu-Gi-Oh! So the question comes up again, like who are these games for? It's not like these games don't sell, because all in all, people buy these games. There is an audience out there that wants these games to continue, and that's the casual market. These are the people who don't mind paying a little bit for Yu-Gi-Oh! but ultimately have very little passion or very little budget to play in the competitive scene. Like PewDiePie playing Magic the Gathering Arena. Like, you can tell he enjoys playing Magic with his friends, but it seems like he had very little passion to actually play the game in an extremely competitive manner, like outside of playing the game on ranked online. I got nothing. <laughs> Oh, you're down to one now, bitch! And now you have. Shouldn't that shouldn't that trigger? Why did it not trigger? Oh, that one didn't have life link. Okay. I'm an idiot. Bye. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that I miscalculated and did a couple of misplays. Cause I'm the best gamer of the world. You guys don't understand. Don't even try to have your pre-built shitty decks going. Oh, I think Gogari is pretty good. But that. And unfortunately for people in this bubble of the casual Yu-Gi-Oh! player base, they get the short end of the stick when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! games like these. It feels like the only Yu-Gi-Oh! games that actually properly cater to their audiences and still has people talk about them are maybe the Tag Force and World Championship games. And unless Konami changes their mindset and approach to how these games are made, rather than what feels like a copy then paste formula, it seems like Yu-Gi-Oh! games will never actually get any better. But to be fair, there is one game that survived these past few years because it had an appeal to the masses on a platform that was convenient and consumer friendly. It feels like this app has more effort and support put into it than just about every other Yu-Gi-Oh! game combined. And with the amount of support it's gotten from both the Yu-Gi-Oh! player base and from Konami itself, it's easy to understand why this game has gotten as big as it has. And that's Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. I mean, hell, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links has better summoning animations than Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution. How does a phone app have better summoning animations than a game, than a full-fledged video game made in 2019? That's, what, that, that's the questions we should be asking ourselves.